Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is one of the early lessons in our series entitled The Three Angels' Messages. Now, if you're an Adventist or you've studied these lessons in the past, you might re recognize that that should be a pretty important series. This is lesson number three in that series for April 15 of 2023 entitled The Everlasting Gospel. That should be very important, shouldn't it? Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we are bowed here before you seeking to know the truth, to understand what the is issues are and talking about an everlasting gospel. May it teach us more about you is our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So what is the everlasting gospel? Gospel, of course, means good news. What would that be, Jim? You know, another way it could say the, the message to help make you good. Well, that would be nice if it worked. Well, that, well <laughs> <laughs> anyway, let's go with it. In ancient Israel, when the heathen around them were polytheists, worshiping multiple gods of wood and stone, Israel's clear, identifiable, powerful statement of faith was found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This is from the New King James Version. And we're going to look at it in the, from, from the Good News Bible in a moment later. Throughout the centuries, the chanting of the Shema, the name of the prayer based on Hebrew word for hear, reminded the Jews of the spiritual vision that united them at a pe as a people and that strengthened their resolve to maintain their unique identity as worshipers of the one true God. For Seventh-day Adventists, the three angels' messages in Revelation 14 are our Shema. They are, excuse me, they are our identifying statement of faith. They define who we are as a people and describe the mission to the world. In short, our unique prophetic identity is outlined in Revelation 14, 6 to 12. And it is here that we find our passion for, to proclaim the gospel to the world. From the Bible Study Guide for April 8. Okay, so in our Good News Bible, we discover that there are several ways to translate that Deuteronomy 6, 4. The preferred way is Israel, remember this, the Lord and the Lord alone is our God. But the footnote says it could be the Lord is our God or the Lord our God is the only God or the Lord our God is one. So you can look at that in various ways, but clearly God was telling them, I am it. How does that fit with our study of Revelation 14? Carrie? Then I saw another angel flying high in the air with an eternal message of good news to announce to the peoples of the earth, to every race, tribe, language, and nation. He said in a loud voice, honor, God and pra praise his greatness for the time has come for him to judge. Worship him who made heaven, earth, sea, and the springs of water. Okay, what qualifies a gospel, a good news, to be an eternal or everlasting gospel? Well, let's think about that. Here's a note. A Sunday school teacher in Great Britain was once asked what the teachers, uh, what she teaches her students about the book of Revelation. Somewhat taken aback by shock, she says sometimes, or the book is sometimes called Apocalypsis. Her response was, oh, we never talk about that book. So what do you think of what the book of Revelation is, is when the, what do you think of when the book of Revelation is mentioned? Do you think of frightening beasts? Do you think of mystic symbols? strange images, groups of seven, there are lots of things you could think about. Well, it is revealing something. Yeah. Is it the title isn't it the revelation of Jesus? Right. The revelation of the anointed. The, uh, so it has a message. There's, you would think that there was something to be found there. So right at the very beginning of Revelation, chapter one, verses one to three, it describes the book as a truth that Jesus Christ revealed. Gordon? In the Good News Bible, Revelation 1, 1 through 3. This book is the record of the events that Jesus Christ revealed. He gave them this revelation 
in order to show his servants what must happen very soon. Christ made these things known to his servant John by sending his angel to him, and John was told all that he has seen. This is his report concerning the message from God and the truth revealed by Jesus Christ. Happy is the one who reads this book, and happy are those who listen to the words of this prophetic message and obey what is written in this book. For the time is near when all these things will happen. Okay, and that was how long ago? Long time ago. <laughs> 2,000 years ago. Almost 2,000. Yeah. Blessings are pronounced upon those who read and study the book of Revelation. Charles? According to Revelation chapter 1, verse 5 and 6, Jesus is the one who loves, uh, loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. In Christ we are forgiven, grace pardons our past, empowers our present, and provides hope for the future. That is, in Christ we are delivered from sins, penalty, and power. And one day, soon, we will be delivered from sin's presence. This is the message of the Bible's last book, Revelation. From our Bible study guide, okay? So here we have that same text in the Good News Bible. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the first to be raised from death, and who is also the ruler of the kings of the world. He loves us, and by his sacrificial death, he has freed us from our sins and made us a kingdom of priests to serve his God and his Father. To Jesus Christ be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Okay, now the question again. What would you say if someone asked you to describe the gospel? I could tell you what Graham Maxwell would say. Okay. God is not the kind of God his friend Satan has accused him to be. Yeah. The most important truth of all is the truth about God. Yes. His character of love, his loving, transparent, freeing way of running his government, and his determination to include as many of us as are willing into that kingdom. Jesus Christ came to this world to teach us about God. The death of Jesus was not a payment of some penalty. To whom would such a payment be made? Does God owe anything to the devil? You know the ancient ransom theory that was believed for a couple hundred years after the death of Christ that we as a human mankind sold ourselves in the hands of Satan so uh, God comes to him and he says, I'll give you a deal. I said, I'll give you Jesus Christ if you'll give me all the human beings back. And Satan always wanted to have to be in Christ's place anyway, so he said, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll trade you. But what he discovers is that he can't hold on to Jesus. Jesus escapes from his thing. So God wins the great controversy by deceiving the devil. Does that sound right? No, that is not right. <laughs> well, that was taught as gospel truth for a year, hundreds of years. So to whom would such a payment be made as God owing? Sure, I'm sure we're not wrong about any of the things we believe now, of course are not. we? Does Jesus owe something to the Father on our behalf because he, Jesus, has become human and humans have sinned? Let us never make the mistake of thinking that Jesus loves us more than the Father. Think of John 3.16 and John 16.26 and 27. We must never try to place any kind of separation or barrier between the Father and Jesus. And here's a statement, a very important statement about that. Had God the Father, this is from Ellen White, had God the Father come to our world and dwelt among us, veiling his glory and humbling himself, that humanity might look upon him, the history that we have of the life of Christ would not have been changed in unfolding its record of his own condescending grace. In every act of Jesus, in every lesson of his instruction, we are to see and hear and recognize God. In sight and hearing and effect, it is the voice and movements of the Father. That was written from Australia, Carrie, 1895. Manuscript releases and also part, part of it's, it's, well, part of it's in that I may know on page 338. 
At the beginning of the three angels' messages, we read in Revelation 14, 6, that the good news is eternal or everlasting. It is not just a message for God's end time people. So which is longer, eternal or everlasting? <laughs> no, that's not the right, answer, the right question. It's absolutely essential that we realize that the gospel is eternal or everlasting. What does that mean? This is not some temporary truth, either just for us who live at the end of this world's history or even temporary truth that extends to the full extent of human history. The gospel is a truth about God which has always been true. The truth about God needs to be understood in contrast, Charles, to the misinformation about God that has been spread and is being spread by Satan. A part of the gospel is how God responds to our sins and our mistakes. God always loves all sinners, but he hates sin. He hates sin because it destroys and damages his children. And that's why it says that thou, O God, may be justified, mm -hmm. vindicated when thou speakest. Romans 3.26. Sure. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. It's that in Psalms 3, 4. also. Romans 3.4. I think yeah. it's in Psalms as well. Yeah. yeah. There is no sin, I want to emphasize this, there is no sin which God cannot forgive if we're willing to come back to him. So here we come to Romans 3, 24 through 26, Jim. Yet all who are willing are healed freely by God's gracious, gracious remedy, which has been provided by Jesus Christ. God presented Jesus as the way and the means of restoration. Now, through the, through, excuse me, now through the trust established by the evidence of God's character revealed when Jesus died, we may partake of the remedy procured by Christ. God did this to demonstrate that he is right and good because in his forbearance he had suspended for a time the ultimate consequences of our being out of harmony with his design for life. Yet he has been falsely accused of being unfair. He did it to demonstrate at the present time how right and good he is so that he could also be seen as being right when he heals those who are, excuse me, those who trust in Jesus. This is from the paraphrase of Dr. Timothy Jennings, the Remedy New Testament. That's a good, good one, Ken. I, I really like that one. Okay, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. You want to take that on, Carrie? Yes. And now I want to remind you, my brothers and sisters, of the good news which I preached to you, which you received, and on which your faith stands firm. That is the gospel, the message that I preached to you. You are saved by the gospel if you hold firmly to it, unless it was for nothing that you believed. I passed on to you what I received, which is of the greatest importance, that Christ died for our sins. As written in the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised to life three days later, as written in the scriptures. That's from the Good News Bible. I, I, every time I read a passage like that, I try to imagine, okay, Paul is out there. He's in some pagan city in Europe. And he tells, let me tell you about the guy who died, was buried, and rose by his own power and came out of the, out of the grave. I mean, those people, how would they have responded? Yeah. Huh? What are you talking about? They must have, he must have had fun trying to describe it. Notice that it must be first demonstrated that God himself is right and good before he can help us. If God were anything like Satan has claimed he is, would you want to have anything to do with him? And the answer is, I don't think so. Notice four points in these passages from Paul as outlined in the Bible, the study guide that might give us some clues. Gordon? On Monday, number one, we are justified freely by grace. Number two, grace is a declaration of God's righteousness. Number three, grace justifies those who by faith accept Jesus. And number four, God's love was demonstrated for us while we were yet sinners. That's from wow. Monday. If you back, back up to number one there, mm -hmm. justified is 
another way of saying made right or yeah. made righteous mm -hmm. and, or become righteous. It, it's a process. It's a process of education. It's not a quick uh, de declaration yeah. on the part of, uh, of another person. It's a, a, yeah. to educate. But it's not that we have to pay anything for it. No, it's free. absolutely not. Yeah. I couldn't be more emphatic about that. Yeah. But once we accept the grace, we do his will. It's not the other way around. It's yeah. not, I'm doing will so I can have grace from him. No. no. Because we've been bathed in his grace, so, okay, I'm, now I'll do the will. It's education. Yes, sir. I think Ellen White says education is redemption. Maybe uh -huh. redemption is education. It, it's, it's, education takes time. It's not a, somebody putting a mark on a book. It's something that goes on in your head. It's a yeah. process. So try to imagine yourself being appointed as one of the disciples of Jesus. How did it change their lives? What did they think when Jesus picked them out? There was a big crowd there. And he picked out 12 of them. Well, he picked out 11, and one Judas Iscariot tried to force his way in, and Jesus said, okay. What did they think they were, they were lining up for? Not what they ended up doing, <laughs> being martyred. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. they, thought they, were, they thought they were signing up to be a part of the new kingdom, the new king's entourage, ahead of the Jews. And they ended up being martyrs, almost all of them. Well, even others, such as Paul, Barnabas, and Silas, found that their thoughts about Christ and what he did for us absorbed their lives. Charles? Christ's grace is unmerited, undeserved, and unearned. Jesus died the agonizing, painful death that lost sinners will die. He experienced the fullness of the Father's wrath or judgment against sin. He was rejected so that we could be accepted. He died the death that was ours so that we could live the life that was His. Okay. So let's, let's drill down a little bit. I, I, I think we need to talk about the fullness yeah. of God's wrath. Are you going to... Do yeah, you we are. Wrath? We're going okay. to talk about that. that. I can't... Yeah. I hate to see you leave it there. That, no, no, I'm not going to. That's painful. Why was all that necessary? Couldn't God just forgive us and accept us back? And if not, why not? Is the Father demanding a pound of flesh and payment for our sins? If we deserve to die because we are sinners, why would the death of the only, quote, human who has ever lived on this earth who wasn't a sinner be required to pay for our sin debt in which he had no part? There's no... Right? There'd be a problem with Satan and the one-third of the angels. Well, how about the other two-thirds? They still had things to learn, didn't they? Oh, absolutely. And the way we learned it wasn't until the cross that they finally, you know, we're talking a long period of time that right. they were mm. dealing, wrestling with these questions. Yeah. I like the statement he says, the two thirds, excuse me, one third chose to reject it. The other two heard the, heard the same information, but they chose to stick around longer until they finally get the thing worked out. They didn't mm -hmm. just uh, follow like a... Ellen White in the book Desire of Ages, page 25, so you know this is right in the first few pages, said, Christ was treated as we deserve, that we might be treated as he deserves. He was condemned for our sins, of which he had no share, that we might be justified by his righteousness, in which we had no share. He suffered the death, which was ours, that we might receive the life, which was his. With his stripes we are healed. Many, many pages later, she explained that that business in, in quite a bit more detail when she was talking about the death of Christ. Look at these words. I think, Gordon, is that yours? Upon Christ is our... So this is from Desire of Ages, yeah. page 753. Upon Christ as our substitute and surety was laid the iniquity of us all. He was counted as a transgressor that he might redeem us from the confederation of the law. Condemnation. The condemnation of the law. Sorry. The guilt of every descendant of Adam was pressing upon his heart. The wrath of God against sin, the terrible manifestation of his displeasure because of iniquity, filled the soul of his son with consternation. 
All of his life, Christ had been publishing to a fallen world the good news of the Father's mercy and pardoning love. Salvation for the chief of sinners was his theme. But now, with the terrible weight of guilt he bears, he cannot see the Father's reconciling face. Okay, let's, back, let's, let's now come to Jim's question here. Okay, what's happening here? What's happening here? Father is withdrawing himself from Jesus, right? Separating. Okay, go ahead. The withdrawal of the divine countenance from the Savior in this hour of supreme anguish pierced his heart with a sorrow that can never be fully understood by man. So great was this agony that his physical pain was hardly felt. Okay, now we're gonna, we gotta interrupt here again. What had Jesus been through already? Beatings. A crown of thorn, beatings, I mean, his whole back was probably bleeding. He was, you know, just suffering something awful. I'm sure the devil did everything he could to make every one of those lashes as painful as possible. But he is, when, he, when he felt that his father's presence was separating from him, and I don't know exactly how he perceived that, but that was the only thing he was concerned about. He wasn't concerned about his back. He wasn't concerned about the crown of thorns on his head. His physical pain was hardly felt. Okay, let's go ahead. Continuing with the next paragraph, Satan, w with his fierce temptations, wrung the heart of Jesus. The Savior could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave, a conqueror, or tell him of the Father's acceptance of the sacrifice. He feared that sin was so offensive to God that their separation was to be eternal. Now there's an eternal we need to talk about. Yeah. Okay. Forever. Christ felt the anguish which the sinner will feel when mercy shall no longer plead for the guilty race. What does that mean? There will be people outside of the New Jerusalem at the third coming and they will begin to get a real understanding of what it would mean, what it means to be in God's presence, to understand His love, to realize what what the kingdom of God is about, about, and then they're going to realize, no, I have chosen to withdraw myself from that, and God will say, okay, if that was your choice and you, the choices you made when you had a chance to make your choices, then I will have to separate myself from you. And if they if they are on that wrong side of the fence, yeah. it's because they would be uncomfortable in, on God's side of the fence. We're going we're to talk about that. Go ahead. It was the sense of sin bringing the Father's wrath down upon him as man's substitute that made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. Desire of Ages 753 by Ellen. Okay, what was it that was so hard for him? The separation. The separation. And so what, what was it the cause of, what, what is another word for the separation? The Father's wrath. That made the cup he drank so bitter and broke the heart of the Son of God. Okay? So we need to know. Okay, we're going to go on. We're going to talk more about that. Jesus felt the presence of his Father every day during his ministry. He prayed to his father every night, sometimes talking or praying with him all night long. See Luke 6, 12, 12. However, on the cross, Jesus felt the presence of his father going away. The agony which this loss of his father's presence caused in Jesus was so great that, quote, his physical pain was hardly felt. We cannot even imagine that kind of pain. So now the question should come to us, do we feel pain every time we choose to sin, thus separating ourselves from God? I'll let you answer that for yourself. And we must remember passages like 2 Timothy 1.9, Titus 1.2, and Ephesians 1.4, which we don't have time to read right now, which tell us that God planned all of this before the creation of our world. The Father, and the Son, the Holy Spirit, they had sat down, they knew what was coming. They fully understand it. They knew all this thing, and just, we're gonna do it anyway. We're gonna save humanity by going through all of this. Wow. 
Can you imagine the Father and the Holy Spirit counseling together and planning out exactly what Jesus would have to do when he came to this earth? Charles? The three angels' messages are a story of grace. Hmm. They are the story of a Savior's love beyond measure, a story of Jesus who loves us so much that he would rather experience hell itself than have one of us lost. They are the story of our boundless, unfathomable, incomprehensible, undying, unending, infinite love. Wow. <laughs> yes, okay. wow. God is never caught by surprise. He's not subject to the changes, changing winds of humanity's choices. As we have already seen, His plan to deliver us from the domain of sin was not some afterthought. When sin reared its ugly head, God was not caught off guard by the awful drama of sin. The phrase everlasting gospel in Revelation chapter 14 verse 6 speaks of the past, the present, the future. That when, would be everlasting, wouldn't that it? That is everlasting, yes. When God created humans, with the capacity to make moral choices, he anticipated that they would make errant choices, errant choices. Um, once his creatures had the capacity to choose, they had the capacity to rebel against his loving nature. The only way to avoid this reality would be to create robots being, being, being controlled and manipulated by some divine cosmic create a cosmic plan forced allegiance to contrary forced allegiance is contrary to god's very nature love requires choice and once beings are given the power of choice the possibility of making the wrong choices exists therefore the plan of salvation was conceived in the mind of god before our first parents rebelled in Eden. This is... Wow. Yes. It's the, an in interesting picture that the Bible study guide gives. It's uh, not usually as great controversy model um, this friendly. Is, this is Mark Penley. Yeah. He uh, apparently has a similar view to you. The plan, of our, the plan for our redemption, Ellen White says, was not an afterthought a plan formulated after the fall of Adam. It was a revelation of the mystery which hath been kept in silence to times eternal, Romans 16, 25. It was an unfolding of the principles that from eternal ages have been the foundation of God's throne, Desire of Ages 22, going back to like the very first page of Desire of Ages. Doesn't Ellen White mention that uh, because they had the plan, Satan says, why was I not invited and rebellion started. Yeah, yep. Yeah, she does. By the way, Gordon, I wouldn't say Mark Finley got it from me or that I got it from him. We both got it from the gospel. I, I, I didn't try to say <laughs> either one of those. Either one of those choices. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just clarifying the matter. We, we Ephesians. Might, we, might, we might say you both got it from the Bible and yes, from Ellen and White. It, yes. Ephesians 1 verse 4, even before the world was made, God had already chosen us to be his through our union with Christ so that we would be holy and without, without fault before him. Before the world was created, God already Go knew. Go back to that previous uh, paragraph 19, which says, the, the, um, God is never caught by surprise. Yeah. Uh, and this it restated there. And as far, if God has foreknowledge, Mm -hmm. There's he's no there is no surprise and so we talk about emergency majors you know where that term came yeah. from and I have to disagree with that with that position because it's it's not a surprise it's it's part of the education of the universe. Well, there was a great Sabbath school discussion one time in a certain Sabbath school class that I won't mention about whether or not you could have a surprise birthday party for God. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. <laughs> 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 it, you have to stop and scratch your head for a while and say, hold on now, just a minute. <laughs> there's, a, there's a couple of items in there that are a little difficult. Birthday? 
and surprise. That, and and it, it, along with that, uh, to be safe to save. Yeah. Now, it's, if you understand the word is heal, yeah. then it, it's not. It's it's a different paradigm. Mm -hmm. Different way. But of you, you have to you have to meet people where they are. Yeah, but we try not to confuse them in yeah. the process. What does it suggest to you to be told that you have been chosen by God for salvation? In fact, you were chosen before the foundation of this world was laid. Yeah, but you kick that too far, then you got Calvinism. Well, you no, know, no, no. It just means that God chose you. It doesn't mean you're going to accept the choice. Oh, I understand that. But, okay. Uh, with, but this idea of, of Calvinism, yeah. I, I had some dealings with a fellow by the name of John Robbins that was a Calvinist. And, you know, why, why, what's the purpose of, of uh, missionaries and, and yeah. te te teaching? Because God already knows. Yeah. I mean, that, that's. Yeah. Not the three the angels' messages in Revelation 14, 6 to 12, which is our focus for this quarter, our response to the devil's actions as described in Revelation 13. Do we clearly understand the differences between Satan's plans as spelled out in Revelation 13 and God's answer outlined in Revelation 14? So what does it say in Revelation 13? Oh, the oh, almost the entire world is going to be worshiping the devil. Is it clear that God intends for this message to be given in its final form to the entire world? Will that be an even higher percentage than currently? Worshiping wow. the devil? I mean, directly how, or indirectly? How can you answer that question? So, if this third angel's message, or the three angels' messages, are supposed to be given to the entire world, think of remote places in the world, how many people would it take to do that? How much time have we committed on a day-by-day -day basis to spreading this good news? Do we spend time thinking about how we can be a part of spreading it? Wow. Jim? According to the urgent end time message of the first of these three angels, the everlasting gospel is to be proclaimed to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Here is a message to so grand, so large, so great, and so comprehensive that it is all-consuming. It demands our best efforts and requires our total commitment. It leads us to excuse me. It leads us from preop, preoccupation with our own self-interest to a passion for Christ's service. It inspires us with something larger than ourselves and leads us out of the narrow confines of our own minds to a grander vision from the Bible study guide for April 12. One wonderful, what a, what a, what a thought. <clears throat> oh, you remember Matthew 28, 19 and 20? How do these ideas fit with Revelation 4, uh, 14, verse 6? Carrie? Matthew 28? Up there, up the Which one, though? Matthew 28, 19 oh, to 20. It's both the same. I got you. Matthew 28, 19 to 20. Go then to all peoples everywhere and make them my disciples. Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. And I will be with you always to the end of the age. It's from the Good News Bible. Now here's an interesting thought from one Christian author about the challenging goal that we are talking about here. Gordon? So from the Bible Study Guide, in his book, A Quest for More, Living for Something Bigger Than You, Paul David Tripp discusses the psychological need of every human being to be a part of something larger than themselves. Human beings were created to be a part of something bigger than our own lives. Sin causes us to shrink our lives down to the size of our lives. Sin causes us to shrink our lives down to the size of our lives. I'm not yeah. sure what that so, means. Well, you I mean, in other words, you're going to shrink down to what the little tiny bit of nothing that you really are. The grace of Christ is given to rescue us from the claustrophobic confines of our own little self-focused kingdom and frees us to live for the eternal purposes and satisf satisfying delights of the kingdom of God. That's from B&B &B Media Group, Living for Something Bigger Than Yourself. And okay. the website is listed in the 
Bible study guide. There's there is nothing more inspiring, more fulfilling, more rewarding than being part of a divine movement providentially raised up by God to accomplish a task far bigger, far larger than any one human being could ever accomplish on their own. The commission given by God described in Revelation 14 is the greatest task ever committed to His church. It is an earnest appeal to give our lives to heaven's grandest task to reveal God's incomprehensible love just before Jesus' return from the Bible Study Guide. Okay. So in 1874, the General Conference sent out our first missionary to Europe. Jane Andrews. Jane Andrews. Ellen G. White called John Andrews the, quote, the ablest man in our ranks. Andrews spoke at least seven languages could repeat the New Testament from memory and knew most of the Old Testament. He was a brilliant scholar, a prolific writer, a powerful preacher, and a competent theologian. So the question I ask, why did we think it was necessary to send the first seven Adventist missionary to the seat of the Protestant Reformation? Is that a good place to start? Are we, are we, accepted truth before, let them accept truth again. That sounds like a good idea. Yeah. Why send a man like that to a place where there were very few believers? Why send the ablest man you had to an unknown mission field? And why was he willing to go? His wife had died a few years earlier. Why would he be willing to leave family behind and friends behind in America and sail with his two children to an unknown land risking all for the cause of Christ? There's only one reason. He believed that Jesus was coming soon, that the message of end time truth must go to the entire world. Throughout our history, our brightest and our best have traveled to the ends of the earth to proclaim God's last day message. They were teachers, medical personnel, pastors, farmers, mechanics, carpenters, and tradesmen of all types. Some were denominational employees, but many were not. They were lay people who believed Jesus was coming soon from our Bible study guide for Thursday. And I have to stop for just a second and remind you about a family I knew about. He was a huge diesel mechanic for these huge, huge, big earthly moving machines and so forth. And he was employed by the U.S. government in Somalia. Less than 5% of the people in those days in Somalia could even read so the family wanted to, to do something to try to spread the gospel there. And of course, you know, you have to be very careful because it's a very, very strong Muslim country. And so they got an idea. Since they had access to the, the embassy post, they signed up for a number of copies of, of nice, brightly colored Adventist magazines. Came to the post, got them. And so every week, the day after the trash was collected, they would pile all their trash in their trash can, and then right on top, they would put Adventist magazines, none of which ever reached the trash. <laughs> none of which were taken away. They, all all of which were taken trash. away, yes. I met some people from South, I forget what country, in Central America or South America. Anyway, they told how they found a bunch of, they became to, came to Adventism, they were going to the the dump, the trash mm -hmm. dump, and they got Adventist books. Really? Seriously, I, I, it's been at least 20 years ago that I heard that story. Okay. From, from the person here's in La Sierra, as, as I remember. Here's a number of passages that um, we can compare. See what you notice here that's in comparison. Charles? Acts uh, chapter 1, verse 8. But when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be filled with power, and you will be witness for me in Jerusalem, in all Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So how far is it going to go? Ends of the earth. Okay. Matthew 24, 14. And this good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the world for the witness to all nations, and then the end will come. How many nations? All the nations. Okay. 
The preaching of the everlasting gospel leaps across the geographical boundaries. It penetrates Earth's remotest areas. It reaches people of every language and culture. Even eventually, it will impact the entire world. How fascinating to know that our message has so far reached more than 210 of the world's 235 countries recognized by the United Nations. What role could you play and how could you better play it in helping spread the three angels messages to every nation, country, tongue, and people? Wow. From our Bible study guide again, physically, what are we but small packets of flesh carrying around our own brains? Gordon, here's your department. A couple of pounds of carbon-based organic material closer in composition to a bucket of fried chicken than to a hard drive. Does that sound right to you? Well, I could uh, make some other comparisons or contrasts. <laughs> I think that would be more appropriate. What can these small self-contained packets of meat mean in contrast to the infinity that surrounds them? To live only for yourself, to live for something no bigger than yourself when there's so much all around us and beyond us is like being locked for life in solitary confinement. So there, Gordon, there's the answer to your other question about being small as yourself. Amid a large city that you can feel vibrating through the walls. And what larger, grander, and more glorious and cons consequential thing could we, be, could we live for than proclaiming the promise of eternal life that we have been given in Jesus. Um, Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Friday. I just couldn't help it, but yeah. uh, we, of all Christians, we Adventists have been given such a beautiful health message yes. to walk among the very elite who do not mm -hmm. believe or don't even know who mm -hmm. Jesus Christ is. To take it to them, uh, it's, it's unbelievable. Uh, number one, number two, um, is that it appears that we are the only ones who have been given the beautiful understanding of a great controversy. No yeah. other Christian, absolutely no other Christian has. Yeah. So why are, what are we so quiet about? When uh, Noah was done building the ark, he was broke. Yes. <laughs> he had no money left. All he needed to do was to forget in safety. So it's important. Early Adventism was consumed with spreading the three angels' messages. And Charles, you remember we visited the spot where Ellen White had yes, that great sir. controversy vision there in Ohio. She wrote, Servants of God with their faces lighted up and shining with holy consecration will hasten from place to place to proclaim the message from heaven. By thousands of voices all over the earth, the warning will be given. Miracles will be wrought, the sick will be healed, and signs and wonders will follow the believers. Satan also works with lying wonders, ever even bringing down fire from heaven in the sight of men. Revelation 13, 13. Thus the inhabitants of the earth will be brought to take their stand. Great Controversy 6, 12, paragraph 1. So how much is included in the three angels' messages? Jim, you want to help us with that? From Ellen White. Sir Several have written to me inquiring of the message of justification by faith is in the, excuse me, if the message of justification by faith is the third angel's message. And I have answered, it is the third angel's message in verity. The prophet declares, and after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. Brightness, glory, and power are to be co connected with the third angel's message. And conviction will follow wherever it is preached in demonstration of the Spirit. How will any of our brethren know when the right shall come, when this, when light. this light shall come to the people of God? As yet, we certainly have not seen the light that answers to this description. God has light for his people, and all who will accept it will see the sinfulness of remaining in a lukewarm condition. They will heed the countenance of the true witness counsel. when he, the counsel of the true witness when he says, 
zealous before, excuse me, be zealous therefore and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and he and will sup with him and he with me. Ellen White, Review and Herald, April 1, 1890. It was just before she went to Australia. We may recognize that the everlasting gospel is the truth about God that will never change. However, unfortunately, there are so many countries that may have only a few Adventists living there, but by far the majority have never heard of Adventists. And in some of those countries, it is forbidden to change one's religion or to evangelize. And the interesting thing is, as, who was it, way back in about the third century said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And you, if you look around the world today, the place where it's very easy to talk to your neighbors and you're free and the free speech and the gospel is spreading very slowly. And places where it's against the law to change your religion, etc., people are fired up and the gospel is spreading more quickly. Why would that be? I'll let you see if you can answer that question out there. Why are these verses in Revelation 14, 6 through 12 so important to us today? These are God's final end time message, his last warning to the people on earth. I've heard it described like this. Imagine you were a parent and you're on a hike and you're, wandering, you're walking along a steep cliff and all of a sudden you find your young child just about to step over the edge of the cliff. He's looking out over there like this. And when you say, uh, please come back. Or would you shout? Would you, I mean, what would you do? You would say, turn around, get away from the cliff, wouldn't you? Well, this is, I mean, this is God's last message. What, what is he supposed to do? I have a theory. Mm -hmm. You have My a theory? theory? is that the organized church will not do the work. I, yes. I have a theory no, that the, the top days are closer to us than we think. Yeah. And Ellen White says what we neglected to do in easier times, we'll mm -hmm. have to do it in very difficult times. Well, is, yeah. God's last message to the people on earth, if we are not instrumental in spreading that message, we are condemning them to the second death. Do we understand the everlasting gospel adequately so that we can spread it in the best possible way? Will it ever be possible to spread the everlasting gospel to every person capable of making an honest decision in the entire world? Could God have sent angels? Uh, couldn't God have sent angels to do this work instead of asking us to do it? Wouldn't, that have been a, wouldn't they have done a better job? Well, and why didn't he? Okay, come on, all you theologians. Think, why didn't God send some angels to do it? I think there's been... Uh, I'm going to put this times when angels were sent here. Yeah, uh, there have been. Yes. I remember a teacher I knew being up in New Guinea. And uh, there was a storm one night. And uh, it was at a girl's dormitory they were worried about. There were outside men. And uh, at the end of it all, people scattered and were asked later, why, why did you run? There was a lot of soldiers up there mm -hmm. that weren't our soldiers. And uh, they didn't see any footprints either. Yeah. Will it ever be possible? Well, the three angels' messages are our, our that's, that's tough, tough to say, our, our, end time message, the identifying mark of those who will be faithful to God at the very end of this world's history. We started our study by talking about the Shema. What's the Shema again? Hero Israel. Okay, the Shema is the Hebrew word for to hear or to listen. It's recorded in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, and its importance in ancient Israel. Notice this incredible story from just after World War II. Uh, Jim, I think that... I think it's mine. Oh, is yours, Kerry? Go ahead. Hero Israel. 
Throughout the centuries of their exile, the chanting of the Shema reminded Jews of the spiritual vision and path that united them as a people. The chanting of the Shema also strengthened the people's resolve to resist the various attempts to force them to abandon their, their I'll do that again, abandon their spiritual vision and path. Deuteronomy 6.4 was the one of the first verses that a Jewish child in ancient Israel was taught as soon as he or she learned how to speak. In addition, Jewish mothers continually taught their young children to chant the Shema before going to sleep. There is an exa amazing example of the power of this faith identity point that took place immediately after the Second World War ended in 1945. Some leading rabbis visited Christian orphanages in search of Jewish children. During the war, many Jewish parents in Europe had placed their children in Christian orphanages to save them from the Nazis. It was the hope of these parents that they would later be reunited with their children after the war. If they, the parents, did not survive, they hoped the surviving relatives or friends would find their children. After the war, most of the priests and nuns who ran these orphanages were unwilling to release the Jewish children back into the custody of their families. The priests and nuns often denied that they had any Jewish children in residence. During one visit, a leading rabbi asked the priest in charge of an orphanage to allow him to return in the evening when the children were going to sleep. The priest reluctantly agreed the rabbi's request. When the rabbi returned, he entered the children's room and as he walked through the aisles of beds, he chanted the Hebrew words of the Shema. One by one, children burst into tears and cried out, Mama! Many repeated the words of the Shema. Mm. The priests were caught completely by surprise. They were unable to erase these children's memories of their Jewish mothers putting these children, wait a minute, putting them to bed every night with the Shema on their lips. The head priest had no choice but to admit that he was mistaken. Thus, these lost children of Israel were able to return home to their people and their, to their Torah. Wow, what a story, can you imagine? I wonder if he went around to other orphanages well, I know there mm -hmm. was some in France in some of those places. I've read about it way back. Burned yep. into the consciousness of these children, indelibly impressed upon their minds were those words that confirmed their Jewish identity. The Lord our God, the Lord is one. I would, I would love to hear the Shema. Yes. <laughs> one of the, the, read in, in Hebrew. One of the best movies I've ever watched is Fiddler on the Roof. Mm -hmm. Their Sabbath celebration is so beautiful. Mm -hmm. So beautiful. Well, what about Ask Adventists? Should we memorize the three angels' messages and find ever better ways to spread them to those around us? I'm sure most of us have memorized the three angels' messages at some time in our Adventist education. The better way to spread them is the ideal. Yes, of course. Gordon, you want to read that next thing? We've got about four minutes left. From Ellen White. And in a special sense, Seventh-day Adventists have been set in the world as watchmen and light bearers. To them has been entrusted the last warning for a perishing world. On them is shining wonderful light from the Word of God. They have been given a work of the most solemn import, the proclamation of the first, second, and third angels' messages. There is no other work of so great importance. They are allowing, they are to allow nothing else to absorb their attention. From mm. Testimonies to the Church, Volume 9, page 1. That's written nine. just about the end of Ellen White's life. Nothing else to absorb their attention. Now, that doesn't mean we, we, we don't have some other responsibilities. That means that this is supposed to be top priority, right? Yeah. These messages are urgent eternal and universal. At their heart is the everlasting gospel. So what is the gospel? It is the eternal good news of Christ's life, death, and resurrection, high priestly ministry, and soon return. And you remember the, 
the passages we read from Desire of Ages earlier. It is the good news that Jesus saves us from our sins and empowers us to overcome. To understand the gospel is to grasp the significance of Christ's undying, unfathomable, exhaustless love for us. The gospel begins in the heart of God. Before we have reached out to him, he is reaching out to us. Before we ever sought him, he was seeking us. And we already read earlier that when, when did God plan for our salvation? Before the foundation of the world. Before, before, the, before Adam and Eve. Before we ever made one move toward him, he was drawing us to himself through the power of his love. The gospel invites us to come to Jesus just as we are, but it does not leave us there. In response to Jesus' love, we will desire to live godly lives. It, and, of course, I mean, shouldn't that be, I mean, God doesn't just say, come and just collapse and, okay, your effort is done, there's nothing more to do. The gospel invites us to come to Jesus just as we are, but it does not leave us there. In response to Jesus' love, we will desire to live godly lives. His grace not only covers our past, but it also works as a dynamic principle in our lives, empowering uh, us to obey. The Apostle Paul makes this point clear in Romans 1, 5. Through him, Jesus, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience. Now that's kind of a strange, it's not kind of the way we would say things in our day. How would you say that? Jesus has given us the power to understand and accomplish obedience to God, right? When we are saved by His grace, charmed by His love, and changed by His power, our natural response is to share with others what Christ has done for us. We've said before that there are three things that we need to do. What are they? Bible study, Bible study prayer, Witness. and witnessing. Are we doing those things? When the gospel breaks our hard, sin-polluted hearts, we long to tell the story of His grace. Understanding the everlasting gospel is the very foundation of our witness to the world. The gospel of Revelation 14, 6, that is proclaimed to the ends of the earth is the gospel that each of us, each one of us, has experienced personally in our own lives. The heart of this week's study is understanding the gospel, experiencing the gospel, and sharing the gospel uh, in the context of Christ's soon coming. Are we prepared? Have we understood the challenge? Are we ready? That's our challenge as Adventists. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, we have come today to s discuss one of the most important things that uh, we could possibly discuss. Why you came, why you lived, why you died, what all that should mean to us, and how it should empower us and inspire us to follow your example not to follow your example just to die, but to follow your example to spread the truth. May that be our experience as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.